Welcome back to Afternoon Express. Now, Emma Sadler is a media law consultant and public speaker. Much of her work involves creating social media strategies and policies for corporates and schools, as well as teaching media law to journalists and lawyers, and lecturing on personal reputation management on various MBA programs. She joins us today for her second visit to our loft to chat more about social media law, how it protects us and what we shouldn't say online. Welcome back to the loft. Thank you, it's so nice to be back. Now, how did you get into social media law? I mean, I, was it even a thing to study? Mm, I think it was a totally by accident. And <laughs> because I speak at schools most days, it actually happened yesterday. A girl came to me after I gave a talk and she said, how to become a social media lawyer? And I said, when I studied, there was no such thing as social yeah. media law because social media just didn't exist. So I think it was a lot of right time, right place. I studied law. I specialized in media law. And then I took a year off um, and I went and I did a master's at the London School of Economics. Yeah. And it was just when everything was starting to happen on social media and the shift from traditional media to digital media was taking place and it was a very academically indulgent year you know it was yeah. enough time to really because when you're working in practice especially in the legal profession you don't have time to get on top of new fields yeah. um, so it was really indulgent I, I really had a lot of time to get to grips with this very new space but the point I guess is that all the same laws apply so where we yeah. used to be dealing with what was being said on the front page of the newspaper now we're being we're dealing with what's being said on Twitter or on Facebook. You co-authored the book, one of my absolute favorites. It's called Don't Fool Yourself with Insects. <laughs> and obviously I read it not because I was going to do that, <laughs> but just because you've got to be so conscious mm. Mm. of what you're putting out into so mm. in, in on social media. How mm. A bad is that? Like, how much can we or should we be sharing? So I think that there's a bit of a default to oversharing. Yeah. And I see a lot of ignorance still in the space. I think it's starting to get better with high profile cases that we've yeah. had in South Africa, like Penny Sparrow, that have really been headline news. I think people are starting to understand that things can go horribly wrong from a legal point of view and from a reputational point of view. Because yeah. the point is we've all become celebrities now and we have to manage our online reputations. It's very important what comes up when, when I Google you. And so I think that's your sort of online CV, looking after your digital footprint, yeah. looking after your digital shadow. So I think education is absolutely crucial because simply what the law says is that as soon as content has been seen by one other person, then all the laws kick in. In the eyes of the law, it's treated as if we'd published it on the front page of the newspaper or said it on television, okay. said it on the radio. So if it's on your t private Twitter, it's been said. As, and... as soon as one other person has seen the content, so yeah. even if it's on a WhatsApp group, as soon as one other person has seen it, then, then in the eyes of the law, it's been published. The problem is that a lot of the cases I'm dealing with now are not just what people are saying online, it's what they're saying in a digital format. So say you and I are WhatsApping each other yeah. and then you take a screenshot of that and publish it further. I can still get into trouble because of what I said, even though my intention wasn't for it to be published so broadly. Okay. We saw that with Judge Mabel Janssen yeah. uh, in the publication of those private, WhatsApp, uh, private Facebook messages between her and the activist Gillian Scutter. Um, so I think that I'm seeing a big shift from... I think people are becoming aware that they've got to be careful about what they're saying on their yeah. profiles, even if they're private profiles. Um, but people still saying really stupid things in digital, uh, which is dangerous content. Digital content is dangerous yeah. content. Once it's out there, it's out there. Let's touch on privacy because I think I'm starting to get quite paranoid almost mm -hmm. about content that I would maybe send, well, in a WhatsApp group, for example. What happens if somebody screenshots it and it's a photograph of myself or, mm -hmm. I mean, are they not then could they not get into trouble for screenshotting that? Yeah, do, do I, you know I absolutely me? understand what you mean. I mean, I'm thinking about it in the context of the recent Kanye West, Taylor Swift um, Exactly. Now, fiasco. surely that's illegal. So, so we all have the right to privacy. Everybody has the right to privacy. Yeah. It's a common law right. It's in our constitution, section 14 of the constitution. What does it mean? Well, the common law test at the moment is, do I have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a particular set of circumstances? Yeah. So where you and I are messaging each other, just the two of us in the conversation, I certainly have an expectation of privacy over that content. Yeah. Then as soon as you can establish you have the right to privacy, then the person who's infringed your privacy can show that they have a defense to infringing your privacy. And mm. the two defenses are consent and yeah. public interest. Consent is, I say, it's okay, you can publish that picture of me naked. Or it's okay, you can publish- Who said there were <laughs> naked pictures that I was sending on? <laughs> <laughs> or something, maybe a confidential, um, confidential photographs. No, I was or thinking maybe of like my credit cards. Status. If I take photographs of credit cards to, to send for a payment to be made or something like that. Don't do that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but, I did that yesterday. <laughs> but, but, um, but absolutely, where, 
you know, where you get closer to the core of a human being, the more private the information yeah. becomes, I think. So, so the defence is consent. I give you consent. You can publish that information. Or public interest. And public interest really just means that, yes, that's private information, but there's public interest that exactly. outweighs it. And that's what we saw with the judge Mabel Janssen was, yes, she had an expectation of privacy. That was a private communication. But the public interest in, in people knowing that somebody who has holds a position as important as Judge Mabel Janssen's position in society, one of yeah. the most important positions, I would say, um, has, uh, it, it has these sort of rape culture views, there's manifest public interest, and that public oh, interest outweighs yeah. her privacy exactly. right. So it's a difficult thing, and I think that we need to start thinking about privacy more and more, because the way the law is formulated is very subjective. So what that means is that the more you look after your privacy, the more of it you have. Exactly. So Guard if, it with your life. Exactly. What does that encryption message mean now on WhatsApp? Mm -hmm. So that was a really interesting development and it was in response to, uh, it was actually a Brazilian case where a court ordered that, um, that Facebook, because Facebook owns WhatsApp, Facebook must hand over content of messages in, in uh, co content of WhatsApp messages. Oh, please in don't a court do that, case. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and and they, they, they refused. And so if Brazil <laughs> does what they do sometimes. They went and they arrested the head of Facebook in Brazil. Just recently, actually, <laughs> they've, they've just shut down the WhatsApp service to try and get them to comply. It's, it's, wow. it's sort of mechanisms to try and get some of these companies that are based abroad and are not necessarily that interested in the laws of every single country in which they operate um, to comply with court orders. And so so what they did is that they said that they have got end-to-end -end encryption now on every single WhatsApp message. So the second it leaves my phone, it becomes scrambled. And the only person who has a key to unscramble that message is, is you, because I've sent it to you. That is brilliant. So what that it is means very comforting. is that they, they don't even have access to the message. So if I get a court order and I go yeah, to Facebook and I say, hand over, we saw it in the Oscar Pistorius uh, Riva Steenkamp case, yeah. where there were messages read out in court that had been obtained from Facebook. They'd been deleted by both by both Oscar and Riva, oh. um, but those messages were obtained from the server because in those days they still kept all those messages. Okay. Now they keep them, but they say they're encrypted. So they say that they don't have access to them. And what it means is then that obviously law enforcement officials won't be able to access the content. So we're dealing with you know, the idea that ISIS can now use a platform like WhatsApp to coordinate attacks and they and can't they be do. intercepted. And, yeah. and they, they do. They have historically used different platforms, but now they'll be able to use WhatsApp. Um, it also means hackers can't intercept messages. Nobody can intercept messages. Mm. So it's a huge step in the right direction of privacy. Yeah. My worry is that people need to really, really think twice before they put anything in digital content. You know, If you're going to say something controversial to someone, Say it to their face and make sure they're not recording. As soon as it exists in your phone, inside somebody else's phone, it's out of your control. That's it. Mm. Do you have any legal advice for us concerning mm. our social media pages? So I think the first is to start thinking about privacy. I really believe that everybody should have privacy settings, yeah. um, particularly if you're uploading pictures of your children. Yeah. So I think that's really important, learning about privacy, what it means to you. I think we're very far behind the international conversation, particularly where it comes to sharing photographs of children in South Africa. Yeah. We've just seen... Last time you told us it's illegal in Germany to, it, share, well, to post photos of your children. It's, it's, they've, they've called for a ban, the German yeah. police. It hasn't actually come into effect yet. But more interesting was in France, uh, they've passed a law that basically says that children, as they get older, if they feel like their parents haven't looked after their privacy rights when they were younger, the, the children can go and lay criminal charges against the parents. Um, and the parents can be arrested or fined. Uh, and so it's, I mean, France has always been a sort of hyper-private society, but yeah. I think it's a very interesting development because Definitely. I think South Africans just default to sharing pictures without thinking about it. The other is where you start getting involved in your personal pages on controversial topics. And of course we must, and the great thing about social media is that it's given everybody a voice. Yeah. You need to make sure that what you're saying can be defended. And the defences in South Africa mostly require truth and public interest. So if you are saying something, you're really expressing your honest opinion, the law allows you to be extreme in your opinions. But make sure they're honestly held and make sure that what you're talking about is a matter of public interest. It's not just your dirty laundry or talking about a specific exactly. person who's not a public person. And then I think, you know, as you become... Uh, you know, more accustomed to publishing online, then you will learn what, what the rules are. Each of the companies have their own, um, their own community guidelines, so mm. that's a good step. I know nobody wants to read the terms and conditions, <laughs> but, but it's, a, it's a pretty good start, uh, learning what you can say, what you can't say, and, and just, uh, just educating yourselves and your children.
Yeah. Um, you, you touched on Oscar earlier, but you were an anchor for the Oscar Pistorius case as well. Social media obviously played a huge role in that case. Do you think it has the power to kind of shift public opinion? I think it does have the power to shift public opinion. I don't think it has the power to shift what the judge is thinking. You know, we've got very okay. robust laws in South Africa um, on the subjudicate principle, which is just a, fat, a fancy uh, mm. Latin term for are you affecting the administration of justice by what we're saying? Yeah. Because we used to have to be very careful, and particularly in countries where you have a jury. Obviously, a jury is much more susceptible to public opinion, reading what they, yeah. uh, believing what they read on Twitter, on Facebook, in the in the newspaper, rather like than a story judge. How to make a murderer as well. Exactly. So, so I think a judge. We expect judges to be held to a much higher standard yeah. of contact, conduct. Um, so I think that it's a very good development. I think that South Africa has one of the most interesting approaches to tweeting in. Court, you yeah. know, well, the, with Oscar Pistorius' case, it was the first big news story in South Africa which actually broke on Twitter. The news itself broke on Twitter, not even a link to an article. Yeah. The, the very first thing that happened was that it, it was. Uh, um, it was broken on Twitter. Then we saw the whole, all the developments happening on social media. We saw, um, particularly in the bail hearing, because there, no, um, there were no cameras allowed in the courtroom in the yeah. bail hearing. So it was, it was really contemporaneous coverage of what was going on inside the courtroom. Everybody around the world could follow those few journalists who were inside court yeah. um, and tweeting. So I think it's a very good thing for open justice, the idea that justice must not just be done, but it must be seen to be done. We also, see evidence, we also saw evidence from social media actually appearing in the case. Yeah. You remember that YouTube video of Oscar Pistorius shooting on the, on the shooting range um, and, and uh, talking about the zombie, the zombie stopper. Yeah. And, and that YouTube video was actually played in court. They also referred to a tweet that was subsequently deleted by Oscar um, about how he'd gone into full combat mode when he'd heard the washing machine on. I think also from a, from a sort of journalistic point of view, it was very interesting to see mm. the relationship between Oscar Pistorius and Riva Steenkamp by looking at their social media content. What are the common mistakes that people mm. make online with their social media I think, profiles? I think the number one for me is people saying things online that they wouldn't say in the real world. Yeah. <laughs> that, I just don't understand why people do it. Yeah. And the, particularly the trolls. And I think that social media can oh, often... The trolls. <laughs> the trolls. Don't Go do, do something them. else. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, social media does lend an air of anonymity so yeah. people can create these accounts but but people who otherwise are very nice people in the in the in the real world suddenly become horrible people online so so I think the first the first Bullies. rule for me mm. is if you wouldn't say it to somebody's face don't say it online if you wouldn't say it in the real world don't say it online then I always say if you wouldn't want your mother to see it don't <laughs> don't not just put it online don't put it into your phone yeah. um, and and when I say your mother of course I mean your friends your children your grandchildren yeah. uh, don't don't let it exist I think that's a pretty good rule yeah. of thumb and then don't think you're anonymous online because when you go online you leave a trail and yeah. and I think if we can start beating the anonymity crisis of the internet, then we'll start getting somewhere to having more responsible um, content online. Emma, thank you so much for coming through. I think you're the smartest person I know. I love you. I've got such a huge crush on you. <laughs> we absolutely applaud Emma for her dedicated efforts in protecting our rights online and empowering the public with a better understanding of social media law. Five Roses salutes you and your commitment to your work, and much like Five Roses is committed to bringing you a range of superior tasting teas. We're giving away a fabulous Five Roses gift pack containing an assortment of their delicious teas. So to stand a chance to win, simply SMS the keyword Five Five Roses, your name and city to 33728. SMSs are charged at 1 Rand 50 uh, each and T's and C's do apply. So visit our website, afternoonexpress.co.za for details. Join us again this time next week when we will be chatting to another exceptional South African woman. And until then, remember that nobody makes better tea than you and Five Roses.